Hi, welcome everyone and thanks for joining today's Visiting Scholars Conversation. Today we have a researcher from one of the world's most prestigious research institutes with us, Dr. Pascalis Gupadenis. I'm Daphne Faber, your moderator today, a junior in uh, engineering technology education in Purdue Polytechnic. Before we introduce Dr. Gupadenis, a brief word about the Visiting Scholars Program. This is a partnership between the Honors College and other campus organizations and colleges to bring thought leaders, creative visionaries, and those at the forefront of their field to campus to engage with our students and our community. Consequently, we wanna offer a sincere thank you to Purdue Polytechnic for making it today possible. Now let's dive into Dr. Gupa Dennis's impressive credentials. Pascalis Gupa Dennis earned his PhD in material science from MCSR Democritus Athens, Greece. In 2014, during his PhD, his research focused on ionic transport mechanisms of organic electrolytes, physics of ionic-based devices, and of non-volatile memories. Following his PhD in 2015, he joined the Department of Bioelectronics at EMSC France as a postdoctoral researcher, where his research focused on the design and development of organic neur neuromorphic devices based on electrochemical concepts. He is currently leading the Organic Neuromorphics Group at the Max Planck Institute for Polymer Research, in which his group is developing various concepts of organic-based devices for neuromorphic processing, sensing and actuating. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Gupa Dennis. Uh, I want to just start off by asking you, uh, for the audience who might not know about the field of neuromorphic computing, could you give a general description of your most recent research project? Yes, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for the introduction, uh, Daphne. It's a great pleasure to be here with you, even virtually this time. Um, uh, so to start with uh, with the field. Uh, so as you probably know, uh, there is there is a great interest right now to find alternative ways to process information, uh, to store information, and uh, the the main source of inspiration, as as always, I mean, is is this is. Uh, these are the biological entities, which means the brain. So the main, uh, let's say, scope or the, uh, let's say, long-term goal of neuromorphic engineering or of neuromorphic computing is to understand, first of all, the workings of the brain, and then to emulate these workings of the brain, or let's say, to, to mimic these workings of the brain uh, in a device-based level, micro I mean, microelectronic device, or a circuit-based uh, level in a sort of, let's say, a reverse engineering process, uh, to put it in a framework, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do, uh, what type of devices do the, the teams in your research group work on specifically? So in, so these are microelectronic devices. So, uh, th there are many different ways uh, to emulate biology with microelectronic devices. So for example, and components. So for example, there are solid state devices and technologies uh, made of silicon, for example, which is a traditional technology. There are also emerging technologies which are in, let's say, in a mature or an early uh, research level. And among all these technologies, um, we also have a small portion of, of, of let's say, this field, which is uh, the, field, the field of organic neuromorphics, uh, which are, these are devices made of organic materials. And these organic materials uh, have several um, uh, advantages uh, uh, in order to emulate uh, biology. So this is the key, let's say, advantage of, of using uh, organic. So they, because they are organic, they are carbon-based, uh, they look closer to biology, let's say, because biology is also carbon-based. So what materials, uh, organic materials specifically, um, are commonly used in your research? So it's, so these are materials and, uh, and devices which, uh, in, in contrast with to the mainstream, which, which are electronic devices, so devices that conduct usually electrons and holes, these are the carriers of information. Uh, in our uh, lab and in many other labs, Course, we are developing organic materials and devices which are able to conduct not only electrons and holes, but also various ions, uh, molecular ions, uh, 
larger molecules, neurotransmitters. So these are all carriers of information yes, that you can find them uh, in biological uh, entities or in biological neural networks or even in the brain. So, and because of this intrinsic capability of this kind of devices and materials to, uh, to process this information, these carriers of information, then again, they have the capability to, to, to emulate biology more precisely, let's say, or in a more realistic way. So what are the uh, advantages of using uh, neuromorphic technologies over more traditional non-biology-based technologies? So, yeah, this is a really nice question. So everything depends on the technology or on the mm -hmm. needs, All right? So there are, for example, uh, special applications or the, 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 there are several areas of applications which which traditional technologies are are really well suited and, and nobody has to touch them like I don't know traditional computing or traditional storage for example traditional CPU but for other applications of which we don't really care about uh, let's say the performance but we care about extracting specific information uh, we care about uh, interfacing electronics with other environments for example biology or mechanical structures for example or other entities uh, such as such as uh, even uh, plants for example or other entities which are a large scale, for example, and we need electronics to, to surround them, then these are special applications at which uh, neuromorphic uh, computing or uh, you know, unconventional computing uh, techniques can be, can be very beneficial. So I'm, I'm not claiming, or the community is not claiming that neuromorphic computing which will substitute everything uh, or traditional computing systems, but these are, you know, uh, two, two ways that they will go on parallel and uh, they will deviate in certain applications at which classic computing is, is not enough or it's very high performing, uh, maybe it's very expensive, uh, maybe it's not, uh, it's not suited for, for interfacing an environment, for example. So there are many small scale applications at which neuromorphic computing can, can be suitable. For, uh, for computing several different concepts. Yeah, those are all uh, really interesting applications. Um, kind of going along with that, how do you see the field changing within the next five years? Five to 10 years, let's say, yeah. So right now we are, yeah. So right now we are, I believe that we are in the beginning of a new era, so we know, I mean, as a community, uh, what are the capabilities of, of artificial neural networks? I mean, neural networks which uh, are running in in classic computing systems. That these are, you know, for example, um, uh, pattern recognition processes that you use every day in your mobile phone or in, in your uh, search engine, for example. So we know that the, the, the capabilities are more enormous there. So we are only at the beginning of, of, of this phase. Uh, emulating biology just with software or just with classic computing, again, is not enough if we want to take full, full advantage, I mean, of, 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 of biological computing uh, systems. And to answer your question, I believe that right now we are in, in, in a stage which is similar to what happened uh, a few decades ago when we had these fixed lines uh, for, uh, for, uh, for making phones. And you knew that it was a really great, I mean, th there was a really great potential to communicate with others, but you always have to, had to be at home because you were always limited by, by a fixed line. And by the time that these mobile phones were introduced, then they, there was a completely new era. So this is what will happen with artificial intelligence. Now we are, you know, the, at the beginning, there were only this kind of uh, artificial intelligence in large data centers or large supercomputers for specific computational tasks. Right now, uh, you can run some, let's say, 
algorithms even in your home uh, but again for for specific computational tasks and in i don't know five or ten years we will have probably in the market i'm not really sure yet but we'll have in the market many different technologies of uh, neuromorphic chips which will be dedicated for, for different tasks so your the artif artificial intelligence will be on your hands in five or, or ten years and when I, when I mean in your hands, I mean even integrated in your body. That's really interesting. Um, kind of along those lines as well, um, what applications would you like your work to have uh, within your lifetime? Within my lifetime, eh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so I believe in... In the short term now, I would like to see devices or uh, uh, computational concepts, let's say, that would be able to integrate with biology more efficiently, that would be able to talk with biology on the same time scales, let's say, and with the same language, which is not trivial right now. And these kind of, of devices, which are, some of them are already there with uh, some specific limitations, but some of these, you know, platforms are already there. But in the future, we will have even more, or I would like to see even more advanced uh, systems that would be able to cure or detect diseases on the fly, or in an even, you know, preliminary stage, or even to detect, uh, um, let's say, uh, some some kind of metrics before the actual disease. Uh, I would like to see devices or systems uh, which will, uh, uh, let's say, fix or even replace the operation of, of, of organs. All these are, you know, neuromorphic uh, systems uh, working on the interface with biology. And in, in the longer term, I believe that we have to, you know, understand biology, understand how the, the, the brain is processing information, which is not trivial, it's, it's a never-ending problem. And um, I would like to, 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 as long as we understand what happens in the brain, I would like to really replicate uh, or mimic um, with really highly efficient circuits uh, what happens in, in our brain. And another interesting aspect now, which is, probably between long, short and long term applications, pro probably towards the long term applications, I would say, is that uh, apart you know, from bioelectronics and uh, from detecting diseases uh, or from re replacing organs, uh, I think there is also a great potential in, in the communication between uh, you know, us human beings, even if we like it or not. Uh, I'm not, I'm not a supporter or, or, or not of, of this approach. I mean, but even if we like it or not, we are limited on, on the way we communicate. So everything usual is verbal. So we are based in a verbal communication or in, in a written communication. And, um, you know, in order to, co to, to convey complex messages, we are, we are somehow li limited in our language, for example, even if, if we talk another language, I mean, there is suddenly a barrier. Mm -hmm. If we come from different cultural, uh, you know, backgrounds, there is also a barrier. Um, so there are also non-verbal, other non-verbal communication, uh, I don't know, uh, processes which were involved in uh, during the history, for example, arts. Arts is, is another way of con conveying, let's say, complex, uh, uh, concepts with uh, non-verbal techniques, for example, painting, uh, poetry, uh, music, instrumental music, uh, for example. Uh, there are also, you know, so, some 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 sort of specific diseases which they show how complex the brain is, or how complex our our you know understanding or our our thinking it is. For example, um, pathological disorders like schizophrenia. Or other orders which are not so serious, like um, um, synesthesia, for example. Synesthesia, it's a, it's a, it's a really nice, nice. It's an interesting, uh, let's say, dysfunction of the brain at which the brain confuses different senses. And statistically, many artists have uh, synesthesia, so they smell uh, voices, for example. 
And this is this these are just you know some examples which show how how complex the, you know the, the the processing the processing in our brain uh, is and how you know specific individuals under certain conditions can communicate this 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 inside of us and this looks very weird to us. So as long as we have I will not call them devices I will call them. Uh, I would call it a technology or a platform that would be able to or would allow us to communicate as human beings non-verbally. This will not save us, you know, an enormous amount of data, but it will also open, uh, you know, new avenues of, uh, you know, uh, understanding each other. There are a lot of ethical issues inside this statement. Uh, but uh, these are processes that will not happen you know, in the next five or ten years. Mm -hmm. So what do you think would have to happen in order for all of these things that you've kind of described to, to come true, uh, and especially to make sure that they come true in a way that is ethical? Mm -hmm. this, this would be at the end a collective effort, uh, an effort of the community itself. Which means that every every small part of a community has to play a, speci a specific role. Um, sometimes, you know, a community. These are examples that we saw. I mean, in, in, in the in, in scientific progress. So sometimes, you know, the community is taking the wrong way, and then uh, it returns back in the right way. So the scientific community has these mechanisms, you know, to, to create a feedback, and uh, you know correct, let's say, errors. It's a, it's a slow process, but it happens. So we have to be sure that whatever we do conforms with uh, the needs of our society, uh, respects us as human beings. Everything is ethical, of course. Every, everything in, in a practical I mean, way, everything does not harm us. If we are talking about devices that interface uh, biology, uh, we also have to, to respect uh, private data uh, to some extent. Uh, so there are many different, uh, you know, aspects of, of technological development, and there are many different, uh, uh, let's say, um, communities that they have to work together. Not only scientific communities, and I think that there is a cross, let's say, cross communication between communities. Uh, technical communities, non-technical communities, communities that they are working on, on ethics, uh, on uh, health issues. At the end, I believe that we will bring the best out of a technology. Because always a technology has a dark and a, and a bright side, every technology. Yeah, something that you um, kind of touched on there was the need to involve people from a lot of different backgrounds. Um, I know that the Max Planck Society has a, a value to multidisciplinary approach to research, uh, which is something that we also value a lot here at the Honors College. So I was, something if you could I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, your experience with research in multidisciplinary teams. Yeah, this, this, is, this is a great question. I mean, I'm, I, keep, I'm, I keep learning, I mean, from this process. Um, so, um, to familiarize you with the Institute, I mean, it's a Max Planck Society, not the Institute. It's, it's, it's a society which consists of, of 80, 85 institutes. Um, the background is really diverse, so you can find these institutes working from, uh, I don't know, music and cultural sciences up to um, astronomy. Uh, there are always, uh, you know, these cross collaborations between institutes, and um, it's a great place. To, uh, it's a great, it's a great place to work. And if uh, you really want to do interdisciplinary research, you have, you really have to try, and you really have to train yourself. I will not say in a specific way, but you have to be open. For example, in different backgrounds, you have to, uh, for example be able or you have to train yourself to talk different languages for example if there are if there is uh, on the other side of the river if there is a, a let's say a community or a society that you have to approach uh, personally i don't uh, expect the other community to, to speak my language i have to do both steps 
to reach the other community, which is hard. I mean, it's not. I, I'm not. I'm not claiming that I'm always successful or not. I mean, uh, but you have to be able, or you have to train yourself to speak many different languages. Uh, and by many. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, please, 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 double me. Quick. By speaking um, many different languages, do you? I assume you mean like in a metaphorical sense versus you know literally speaking many different languages. You mean metaphor metaphorically speaking. So if if you start you know collaborating with with, uh, with people from different backgrounds, you at the end at some point you end up talking about, for example, the same physical phenomenon, but people they you know they are using so different language, technical language, and they don't even realize that they are talking about the same thing. <laughs> and the job for, for a PI, for example, is uh, to convey this message to the others, uh, to, to make it clear that every community has its own jargon or, I don't know, its own, uh, uh, let's say, language. And our duty is uh, to build bridges um, between different communities. So do you have um, recommendations for undergraduates who are looking to be involved in interdisciplinary research teams, maybe on a, maybe not a, a, a high level research scale, but on a more lower level scale for things that they can do to make sure that there's mutual group understanding? No, for me, there is no le low level and high level skill. I mean, okay. you have, you start from the basics and after that you start building, but I don't, you know, I don't consider the skills of students low level skills and the others high, high level skills. So it's something that you build gradually. And so regarding your, your question now, again, someone has to be motivated, not has to be, someone has, yeah, has to be motivated to understand other disciplinaries. They have to be willing or they have to understand uh, that um, multidisciplinary subjects demand, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, to see a subject from many different areas. Uh, so they have to be dedicated on, on uh, maybe on studying different areas. Maybe they have to be willing to sacrifice, let's say, quality, uh, sorry, uh, quant uh, qual quality, yeah, oh, sorry, quantity or quality. So they have to be really of, of a quality. Uh, there are, on the way, the, the, there will also be some, uh, you know, some successes. There will also be some failures. Uh, they don't have to take very seriously the, the failures, not the successes also, <laughs> either. Um, and, you know, uh, interdisciplinary research is also a game. And it's a game like many other games. So there, there are specific rules on, on that. And if you are, you know, if you are very dedicated and you understand the rules, uh, of course, there are many cases that there are not rules at all. I mean, but if you understand the game, I mean, and you are dedicated and you train yourself, I think that they are going to succeed at the end. They have to have an internal need of understanding, you know, an entity, a phenomenon, a project from very different aspects. So this is the, the, the key for me. And acquire the, 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 the needed tools, right? Thank you. Do you think that when you were an undergraduate, you had these skills, or do you think you had to, to build them? No, of course not. <laughs> Nobody is born with these skills. I'm not, I wasn't perfect, and of course, I'm not perfect now. I mean, um, gradually, you realize, I mean, you build up some interest for something, and you understand, I mean, that you have a, a lack of knowledge. So you have a core to expertise on something, which is, you know, your background. It could be, I don't know, semiconductor physics, uh, it could be biology or something. But as long as you understand that you want to be involved in a specific, uh, I will not say project, but area, you immediately understand that you have, there is a gap of knowledge uh, in, in, in your core expertise. And this is what I, I was trying to build, and this happened gradually, and this was a, a, a slow and some sometimes you know disappointing and painful experience. I mean, but it, it happens. I mean, it takes time. I mean, <laughs> uh, so as long as, for example, if, if we are talking about my, by my for myself, I'm I'm a physicist, for example, by training. Um, my core expert. I used to be a physicist. I mean, now I'm a little bit of everything. Um, my core expertise was device physics and semiconductor physics. 
I was involved in many projects um, uh, regarding uh, device physics, uh, transistors, memory devices. And when I realized that um, uh, these traditional technologies have several limitations and we have to, uh, at some point, to jump to biology, I immediately understood that I have to learn biology. <laughs> and uh, for doing that, you have to be self-motivated. So there might be many courses that can teach you. Mm -hmm. and in some other cases, you have to be self-taught, which is okay. I mean, it's not a problem. And it's, you know, and always it's a, it's a continuous process, I mean, and uh, it never ends, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. So um, it sounds like through your own motivation, you were um, and you encouraged yourself to uh, find these to make your own interdisciplinary experiences. Or were there other um, experiences either in your undergrad or your graduate programs that uh, helped you develop these uh, desires to, to learn other subjects? Mm -hmm. So if I, if I go back in time, I mean, there is no specific answer on that. I mean, it's, it's a mixture, you know, of, of an internal desire of my background, maybe of some random processes, uh, people that I met on the way, uh, mentors, uh, people that supported me the right time in the right place. Uh, so I don't have a specific answer on that. So the, the only advice that I can give is that they have to be dedicated on their own uh, the students. They have to be dedicated on, on what they are doing, but they always have to be, which means that they have to be focused on their uh, on their target. But at the same time, they have to 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 go far away from from their problem that, that they have to solve on or from their target and see what happens around. So at the same time, they have to be focused and be localized at the same time. Well, can you talk a little bit about um, what your first research experience was? A lot of students here at the uh, Honors College do research in their undergrad. So um, a lot of them had questions about whether you did research in your undergrad, and if not, what your first experience was. So I was, I had experience as an undergraduate, uh, as an undergraduate in, uh, in research. Um, so, I, if I remember correctly, according to the regulations of East of my school, uh, I was obliged either to choose a couple of three courses, which is almost half of a sem one semester, I would say, or uh, a research project. Uh, at the end, if I remember correctly, I did both, so I'm not really efficient. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what I did was that I, I realized that I would like to work on, on, on practical, uh, let's say, issues on, on, semiconductor, on semiconductors. I approached the right person and I ended up as, as an undergrad to work on, on, on um, the physics, let's say, of semiconductor devices that were uh, commercially available. So I was working in a technology node from, from, uh, from an industry and I'm I, now that I'm, I remember myself, I feel really lucky that I had this opportunity back then because I was really, you know, measuring devices that were um, on the market. And this, uh, you know, fueled my desire, I mean, to understand more about microelectronics, um, device physics, semiconductor physics, understand their limitations, understand Moreover, why I don't want to work with classic electronics. Uh, so after this experience, I mean, I had, uh, you know, I, I came up to, to several different conclusions. That's, yeah. that's really cool. Um, so what in general was your undergraduate experience like? Uh, a lot of students haven't had the chance to be exposed to what um, undergraduate study is like in other countries. Yeah, so it's it's been a long time. I mean, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I remember I, I you know I I was I was studying hard. On the same time, I really had a good time with my friends <laughs> because you have to combine both aspects in your life to be healthy. My personal opinion, 
Um, back then I wasn't very dedicated. I don't believe that I was very dedicated. I, I didn't know I wanted to do it. I, I just wanted to do research. Uh, so in my first, I would say in my first, second or, or even the third year, I wasn't so, you know, it wasn't so clear in my mind what I wanted to do. So this this was clear after the fourth year I mean, that I did, uh, you know, this, uh, this uh, project. And, uh, you know, as every life, I mean, has its ups and downs. I also have several disappointments. I also have, I also had many successes, but at the end, you know, the sign was positive, uh, I guess. Mm -hmm. If you're comfortable, could you talk about some of the disappointments you've had, uh, maybe when things didn't go so well um, in your educational career? Yeah, I mean, we are you know, everyone appointments, I mean, and failures. I mean, uh, uh, for example, I mean, it takes time and, uh, to, to understand the subject, for example. Um, I think if you want to be a good scientist, you have to you have to be honest with yourself and you, you have to, to self, let's say, examine yourself. So you have to, to find ways or internal matrices, I mean, to understand if you understand the subject. And this doesn't happen not only with your teachers. I mean, it's an internal process. It's a, it's a, it's a personal, uh, you know, travel journey. And um, I had many of those disappointments. Uh, for example, in, in, in actual courses, uh, in, in the first research experience, for example, because uh, by the time that you start, you believe that, uh, you know, research, uh, let's talk about experimental research, because this is my, my field of expertise. Initially, you believe that research is, is only, you know, touching buttons, pressing buttons and taking the results, but it's, it's also a process which takes time, I mean, to understand the value of uh, or to, to start from, from pressing buttons and to understand uh, a whole phenomenon, for example. And this is, this is a, you know, this is a journey that takes time. It has many disappointments. It has a lot of successes there. Uh, so it's, uh, but everything is normal for me. Uh, the trick is to, to, to learn and get used to it. I mean, and, and by the time that you have a disappointment, you go directly to the next step. I mean, you, you understand what are the sources of, of your disappointment or, or, or failures, but by the next day, you go to the next step directly. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you could go back and change anything um, about your educational experience, would you uh, choose a different degree program, take different classes, uh, maybe join more clubs, some, anything like that? So if I go back in time, eh? I don't know if I want to change something. Maybe, um, maybe we, perhaps it would be nice for me. It wouldn't be nice for me to have some courses in uh, uh, in uh, neuroscience, for example, in biology or more courses. Mm -hmm. uh, I also appreciate, uh, for instance, pure mathematics. I found them uh, very elegant. Um, but anyway, it's it's not like I, I I want to change completely my past. I mean, maybe some things I would have done it in, in 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 another way. I mean, but anyway, as researchers and as academics, we all have a core expertise. But after a while, you be you have to learn or you are trained. I mean, to always to change your expertise. So even if, uh, as an undergrad, I, I didn't, you know, do the, the necessary steps, I mean, for, for training myself, for training myself, you have a whole life, I mean, to fix this, these mistakes, which I don't consider them as, as mistakes, I mean, but, uh, and this is the essence of research, I mean, you always, you, you have to continue learning new things, I mean. so it doesn't, so it's not like everything stops in your, your PhD, for example, your, or in your master's degree. Everything start, starts there in research. From there, yeah. Do you have um, 
any recommendations for young researchers on um, experiences they should pursue? So they have to, they have to follow their dream. <laughs> they have to follow their heart. They have to be dedicated in what, what they are doing. They have to have a, they, they should have good time with their friends in parallel. And it would also be beneficial to spend time in, in different labs with different people of different cultural backgrounds ethical backgrounds. I don't know if I, I use the right expression. Uh, maybe they have to spend, it's nice to spend time in different countries. Um, to have uh, multiple mentors, for example. And to be, or to always try to be in, uh, in a diverse and uh, vibrant uh, environment. Um, so these are my advices. I don't want to be, you know, very specific because it's it's not really important. I mean, but, but if some follows all these things and mostly follows his or her heart, uh, yeah, someone will be successful. I think. So you've touched a couple times now on um, mentorship as being really important. Um, who were your mentors, and wh what did they do to help you, um, just as a person? Yeah, mentors. Eh? So you mean scientific mentors or in general mentors? Uh, okay. Let's say in general mentors, <laughs> any mentors. General. So the, 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 the list is, uh, the list I think is really large. <laughs> so to, I don't know, to begin, I don't know, from, from my parents that they, they, they are always supportive. Every time, in every success, in every failure, my wife, who, by the way, she is expecting our, our child now. So this is the, you know, this is the first public announcement that I'm doing. Oh, she's, <laughs> congratulations. She's very supportive. She's always, you know, trying to, to convince me to, to give, um, let's say, a second opportunity or even a third opportunity to people. Um, my some of my advisors or supervisors, so for example, my, my postdoc supervisor, uh, George Maliaras, who is really nice. I mean, he has his own way to, to let's say, uh, motivate people to be hardworking, but uh, at the same time to, to, to be open-minded. He's, he's a really good, not only uh, mentor, but a good friend. Uh, many other people uh, in Max Planck, in our own institute, uh, Blom, Professor Blom, um, my brother, who is, brother is, for example, he's he's working in the stock market, so he he's a, he's, he's a, he has a weird combination of, of a golden boy and the, and, and the nerd. Uh, I always, you know, remember him. So he was he's sitting on a, on, on the desk um, at the office. And he has on, on the one side, he has two or three screens. He's watching, uh, you know, the stock market, different uh, indices. I don't know, NASDAQ, whatever. I don't know how, how you call them. And on the other side, he has different equipment, electronic equipment. So for example, I don't know, oscilloscopes, voltage generators, whatever, because he likes to fix things at the same time. And he was, you know, the person when I was uh, younger that he he transferred to me this 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 microbe of, 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 of research, although he was not a researcher or a scientist uh, by himself. Um, other other people, my students, of course, the group members, they are mentors for me. Really, I'm not only <laughs> their mentor; they are also mentors for me because they are they are working really hard. And what we see, I mean. The results that we, are, we we see basically it's it's their own work, not my work. I'm only I'm only you know monitoring the process and I'm trying you know to to motivate them to know what they they do even better than me. And yeah, more or less these are the of course friends in, in different straight stages of my life. Uh, we had and we we still have really good time. Uh, in many 
stages in my life, they were the best, uh, let's say, uh, psychologists for me after a couple of beers outside at night. So there are many different people. Mm -hmm. oh, we have had a question come in that I think is uh, really interesting. It's, what challenges or opportunities for international collaboration do you see in this moment? And what do you think research, especially international collaborative research, will look like post-pandemic? Post-pandemic, eh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure. I'm not, you know, this kind of person that I believe that, you know, by the time now that we have this pandemic, there is a switch and everything will be completely different. Uh, as human beings, you know, we still have the need to interact. Uh, with with physical presence, I mean. So I believe that after a while, that the, the pandemic will uh, will go at the background. Uh, I still believe that people will always need to have these exchanges between different labs, going into conferences, uh, for you know maybe for communities or societies or countries which were not really developed in, 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 in digital aspects. I mean, maybe this was a great opportunity for them, I mean, to catch up with other countries. This, this is a good thing that happened. Uh, but I think, yeah, post-pandemic, I, I think and I hope that the situation will be the same or even better. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe with, um, with more digital tools, but we still, you know, with, we need this physical exchange between different universities. Exchange collaborations, exchange of knowledge. Uh, we will still all have, have, have these things. I mean, after I don't know, in a year from now, I guess, or in a couple of years from now. And as uh, you know, as a group, I'm always happy to accept students. Uh, for example, I mean, to I want to learn from them, and uh, I hope that they also want to, to learn from us. Yeah, I mean, we are really open. I mean, uh, all the time. Of course, now there are specific regulations. I mean, today that we are talking, <laughs> I'm talking uh, about, you know, under regular situations <laughs> now. Yeah. So how has um, COVID-19 impacted your lab? The lab, now we are getting, yeah, this is the, this is a sensitive now question. <laughs> now, oh, <sorry>. the situation, <laughs> no, no, don't, don't worry. So the situation is getting back to normal now. Of course, it's uh, with regulations in the now in the labs. Uh, we have to to be connected a little bit more in a digital way, of course. And we realized that uh, because there was no other choice for many people, they didn't have time or they didn't have the means because of the lockdown to spend time on the lab. We understood that there is also a, a great value of staying at home, understand what you did as a PhD, for example student uh, understood what you did in, in the last, I don't know, six months or something, write down a report or a technical paper or whatever, uh, think about your project from, from distance. So if you, you know, if you, if you are working intensively all the time, you don't really have that, uh, you know, this, this, this quality of time uh, to, to stay from distance and understand what you are doing. So for me, I mean, it was it was from one side it was a hard time, but on the other hand, we all had the opportunity to understand, you know, ourselves, uh, our real needs as human beings, because at the end, I mean, we had simple needs, and uh, out of a sudden, in one night, that it all disappeared. Uh, and uh, I, for me, it was uh, it was a good experience. I mean, with of, of course, with many serious side effects for for our communities, of course. <laughs> yeah. So, are there any um, lessons from um, this kind of time period that you think is going to um, shift how your lab does things in the future, like more working from home or something like that? Mm, I always had this mentality that, uh, you know, people go to the lab whenever only is necessary. So mm -hmm. I don't want to see people around, around, you know, the corridors just to be around the corridors. So they have to be in the labs uh, for, spe for a specific reason. Uh, all this, all the other side work can be done, I mean, whenever they want or wherever they want. And 
so the lesson is that we can be as as uh, you know as labs are uh, as I don't know much in society as, as as our department we can be more flexible but still efficient. Uh, mm -hmm. It takes a little bit more effort to do that. People have to be willing to communicate in a better way. Uh, we should have this sense of uh, of co this community like sense that we share things because it's impossible. I mean, if we share labs and we have you know limitations of of, uh, of capacity, we all have to be a little bit flexible and we have to be willing to communicate with the others and to also understand the other side, the other person that we have on the same office. Um, so these are these are all lessons. And these are all, you know, the new skills that we have to to to, to have for for the for the next phase uh, of of this pandemic. I mean, you know, this or, or, uh, the end of the this is the end of the curve, let's say, for the pandemic. So we still need some skills. I mean, to, to be still effective. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, is there anything else that we haven't covered that you'd like to add? Something specific, eh? <laughs> no, Any I don't think so. Any message to all the undergraduates out there? <laughs> the undergrads, uh, it's a really nice time of their life, really. Some of them, you know, I, I, I know that they are very busy. They are, some of them are very anxious for their lives, for their degree, um, for their future. But really, it's, it's a really nice uh, period of their life because they are learning. Uh, not you know, not all uh, all careers are are based on learning, so it's it's a really nice period of their time. So they have to enjoy that. They have to work hard, enjoy that, make friendships, uh, make connections. And if they are dedicated and they, if they have a vision, their own vision, I'm not you know, the person that I, I can define a vision. So if they have their own vision, everything will go awesome, perfect for them. With many well, thank you know, you so much. appointments uh, mm -hmm. in between, of course. <laughs> of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gupa Dennis. Uh, it looks like thank we're you. about at time Sorry. for today. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you to uh, you once again, uh, and to Purdue Polytechnic uh, for this, um, the opportunity to have this wonderful session. Um, a reminder, this is going to be posted on the Purdue Honors College YouTube channel. Uh, and if you'd like to go back and rewatch it um, or revisit a moment or share it with a friend, you can find it there. Thank you for your time and your attention and have a good day, everyone.